My um, essential function here this afternoon was just to talk about the claim. That's uh, the focus of the second section. And for that purpose, I have broken down what I'm about to say into four principal subheadings. About what? In other words, what is being enforced? Secondly, who should and can a claimant be? Thirdly, can you nominate an appropriate defendant? And are you quite satisfied that you have got the correct defendant or that you are not by omission um, excluding somebody who should be in? And finally, what about this question of forum and when do you in fact um, institute the claim? I start then at the substance of this look by just referring you once more to articles 101 and 102 because in effect uh, there's no doubt whatsoever the entire purpose of the damages directive is to underpin the effective implementation um, of 101 and 102 uh, and also to ensure that consumers have a high level of protection right across the European Union. Article 101 direct effect as we all know um, impacting upon the relationship between individuals, creates rights and obligations which national courts are obliged by European law to implement at a horizontal level. And in so doing, they are, of course, um, protecting fundamental uh, rights of EU law. And um, the overarching purpose of the directive, Adam has touched upon a number of these um, during the course of his presentation. And again, I will only touch uh, um, upon a, a limited number. I make the point once more, but it's worth making again, that effective public enforcement was not sufficient. We had to have both, and their interaction optimised um, enforcement uh, right throughout um, uh, the European Union, and of course brings directly into play the position of victims of wrongdoing, who by this directive are entitled, so declared by legislative provision, to be entitled to full compensation. I'll come back to that for a moment, but the mere phrase is really important. The mere image that it conveys, the mere rights that it gives um, to a consumer and the satisfaction that that consumer can take by having that legislative, um, uh, uh, by having that legislative provision under his belt if, when in fact he decides to take an action. Secondly, it introduces um, an element of legal certainty um, with regard to um, uh, with regard to virtually all aspects of of, um, of a claim. Um, I'm talking about the necessity for uniformity. How often have we heard throughout any conference we might go on European law generally that the Commission and every enforcer of European law um, strives to achieve this level of uniformity between member states. Um, and in many respects, this is why the Commission um, is terribly anxious to have seminars of this nature, uh, because undoubtedly each jurisdiction or several jurisdictions, just by, their, by the, the, the level of competition claims they might see, by the, the activity of individuals or lawyers dealing with competition cases, it's absolutely true to say that we have not all moved in unison. And, and, and that's nobody's fault whatsoever. And in fact, that's entirely to be expected. We've had countries and have countries like the United Kingdom, Germany, France, Netherlands, Belgium, and maybe a couple of others who, who, who have gathered a great deal of expertise um, with regard to competition cases. Expertise at the trial level, which is utterly critical as well. Because at the trial level, the demands on a judge can be at least as great, if not greater, than at, at a appeal level. Why is that? Because the trial judge has to make findings of fact. The trial judge listens to the witnesses um, and determines uh, what view should prevail, of course according to domestic rules, but he must do that. And that is far from easy in a competition case if, in fact, you don't have some background um, in economics or if otherwise you're, you're nervous or concerned about fully evaluating or assessing um, the economic evidence. 
I remember on one occasion sitting in a case where um, uh, I had two um, economists running various models and both extremely highly qualified PhDs and if you could get something higher they had that too. They gave diametrically opposed evidence. Um, and as was my nature then, even though um, I've got a bit calmer about it now, it's very difficult to understand how with basic facts, I'll come to these assumptions in a moment, it's very difficult to understand how with basic facts you could have two individuals uh, who came to such a different conclusion. This would be avoided and trial judges' jobs would be made much easier if experts remember what their role was. Their principal function, their primary obligation is to the court. It is not to clients. I keep on preaching it, they keep on ignoring it, and we haven't moved whatsoever in relation to it. I remember the model in question. Um, um, one had a decimal point um, in front of three noughts, and the other had a decimal point in front of one. It made an enormous difference, and it just could not be right because it was a mathematical calculation. And it took a good deal of, of, of research and it took a good deal of questioning to uncover it. So the job of the trial judge is extremely difficult. I, I am not sure if any of you use assessors if you sit a, as a trial court. Assessors would not be appropriate at an appellate level. But at a, at a trial court, in some jurisdictions, there is the possibility of the judge saying that because of the technical nature of the case before him, he requires some assistance here. Um, the process differs from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Uh, there may be a panel of experts that one can call upon. There may be agreement between the parties, subject to the trial judge having overriding control on it. Once the assessor is in place, various debates then ensue as to what his precise role is and what his responsibility is. Who can ask him questions? How can he intervene? Should he simply advise? the court, should he simply explain the concepts at court, and so forth. The, whilst that's quite attractive, and, and I use it in one case, one has to be careful um, in that the assessor does not become the adjudicator of the case in question. And it, it's terribly tempting for, for somebody who's reticent, uh, in particular about economic evidence, it's terribly tempting um, to even subconsciously um, place over a line on what the view of such an assessor might be. But in any event, he's there. The trial court so is very important um, in that regard and um, is, of course, critically important but for a slightly different reason. Um, appellate level makes what ultimately the case lays down ultimately what the law is um, and to that extent, of course, it assumes greater importance than the trial court. But uh, the trial court, for the reasons I've mentioned, does uniformity um, across all trial courts and member states um, is what we must strive for and must continue to do so, even if the pace um, of some of our countries um, is slightly um, um, short of or not, not in parallel to other countries, and that's to be expected. A third purpose of the directive is to remove differences between national jurisdictions. It, it has done so in certain areas, but not to a full extent, and of course that's understandable as well. Um, in the areas not precisely covered by the directive, um, the national procedural laws still play an important part. It undoubtedly established a playing field for the claimants, for the undertakings in question, and also for both. If you look at the way I have um, categorised them, we have now a greater understanding as to how the claim should be formed, pursued, we now would have greater certainty about the chances of success and would at least have a knowledge of the parameters of what damages might be awarded. So a, a, a claimant has some certainty before embarking upon a case. Equally so with an undertaking, because uh, he, that undertaking realises that the rules and liability have been approximated ever closer by this. Uh, they will be able to assess their chances of disputing essential elements such as causation in an easier way. They will also have some view as to what they might potentially be liable for. And of great significance is the fact that it has removed competitive advantages 
and that directly links in to the second point in the last subheading, abolishing forum shopping. And forum shopping, um, which again I'll touch on when I mentioned the Brussels recast uh, regulation, but forum shopping was quite an active uh, pursuit um, in competition cases uh, in several countries. Um, and one can readily see why, not only from a plaintiff's point of view, but also from a defendant's point of view. Um, and, and different competing um, interests um, would motivate a plaintiff to go to country A or country B and uh, an undertaking who sued to oppose vigorously the jurisdiction of either country to embark upon the hearing and instead suggest some other jurisdiction where he was more familiar with and where he thought he would have a better opportunity um, of either preventing the claim ever truly going to trial by making it as difficult as possible, or even if it did go to trial, by getting a more favourable decision than otherwise. Overarching purpose of the directive. However, when you um, come to examine any case in front of you, uh, you need um, just to be even superficially conscious um, of what's outside the scope of the directive. Um, I have, in that first bullet point, said without mere consideration, um, several claims which otherwise might uh, fall within it are rejected. Obviously, before the directive came into force, obviously, in accordance with the directive, if cases have been instituted and are vested in a national court prior to that date, um, if the directive is not transposed within the specified time, subject to, of course, the doctrine of direct effect, and then if it also falls virtually in limine, by which I mean without a mere consideration, by reason of the limitation periods. The limitation periods are going to be a source of um, considerable interest to a lot of people. They, they are set out, obviously, in, in the directive, and they make detailed provision as to what is to occur in certain circumstances. Adam has already identified two underlying principles of effectiveness and equivalence and that is what the last bullet point in that slide is directed at. There cannot be an undue burdensome restriction placed on the institution of a claim or on how it has proceeded and those principles come into play. This is the problem that we might encounter with regard to the um, limitation periods. If you would care to look for a moment at um, the, uh, the directive. In Article 10.2, it says that the limitation period shall not begin until, firstly, the infringement has ceased, secondly, the claimant knows or can reasonably be expected to know three really important points. One, of the behaviour that cause that is that underlies the infringement. Two, having no having knowledge of that behaviour, he must also know as a fact that such behaviour constitutes an infringement. Three, that the infringement um, has caused harm to him, and four, he must know the identity of the infringer. Well, if you take any one of these individually. Um, you can see a great number of practical difficulties uh, emerging at the beginning. Um, if you take uh, the uh, availability of knowledge, or if you take that also a claimant can succeed um, in having the time start only when he reasonably could have known of the infringement. How is he going to find out about the infringement? What steps does he have to take in that regard? When both of those have been satisfied, he must also be satisfied that the infringement, as a fact, um, has caused harm to him. Is he obliged to consult lawyers? Is he obliged to consult economists? What steps does he have to take, in fact, uh, before a defendant could successfully say that time has started to run and thus you're on the hazard? I see a lot of difficulty with those those provisions. Um, in all probability, they're, they're uh, designed 
in Article 10.2, they're more designed for stand-alone actions. But then we have um, Article 10.4, um, which in fact suspends or interrupts the period if the National Competition Authority should take an interest um, and if it should investigate the alleged infringement itself. Um, the period is thereby suspended or interrupted. It does not restart for at least one year after the final decision of the NCA becomes binding. And there cannot be a limitation period less than five years at the level of principle. I've added in there for interest sake the third bullet point. What about the, uh, the um, European Convention on Human Rights and in particular Article 6 and the right to a fair and speedy trial? I could easily have put up another slide um, which not in any way fancifully could have a 10 year or 12 year period uh, before a, a claimant gets a decision on his judicial claim uh, alleging infringement and before a respondent would know the result of that legal case hanging over him for that period of time. I, I, I doubt in fact um, if the European Convention of Human Rights would be entirely uh, satisfied with that and certainly uh, there have been numerous cases by the court invoking Article 6 which, which may indeed um, have an impact in any given case if the time limits or the time periods involved should extend um, in the manner which I've indicated. Um, the next subheading is the claimant and of course um, many of you will obviously know, all of you will obviously know uh, that the prime and first um, identifier there is any individual natural or legal um, undertakings, associations, public authorities and consumers. Um, during Evans' talk to you, um, he mentioned any person and that, um, that raised the possibility of litigants appearing in person to move competition cases. And I, I must say I'm not sure what the situation is uh, in the United Kingdom or what the situation is in any of your individual countries with regard to lay litigants. But I can tell you that we have quite a significant number of lay litigants in Ireland. Um, and they fall into various different categories. Some are single issue individuals and some uh, are, are really public and frequent and, and possessed litigators. I recall on one occasion an individual, Mr. Uh, better not mention his name, who came in to me trying to stop a rerun of the Lisbon Treaty looking for an injunction the day beforehand. And um, I said to him, Mr. So and so, well, what, can I, what do you want from me? Anything you give me, Judge, I'll tell you. <laughs> and, and, and we have those. We have people because of economic necessity, can't afford lawyers, which I understand fully. Um, but the more our experience is that the more complicated the case is, the more difficult it is to try and keep more litigants within some parameters so that within the mire of material they generally produce, some point of substance they have will not be lost. That's always my great fear about lay litigants. They dump everything into you. And they think the more paper there is, the better chance they have of success. And they're probably not skilled enough. They're probably too nervous to identify points and say, look, I have four points. Best point, best point. They never do that. And of course, we read it and try and read it again, but the great danger is somewhere in there, there's a nugget of a legal point that could be missed with all of this. Think that uh, a lay litigant could really uh, manage without great assistance um, from third parties, even if they're not lawyers, in presenting a claim, a claim say, under the damages directive. Uh, again, I don't know what the position is in your individual countries about legal aid. Um, it is not really available in my country um, on the civil side, save in exception circumstances. Uh, subject to means test uh, on the criminal side, um, it is widely available and it, it operates quite effectively. On the civil side, um, you might have the odd 
technical medical negligence case. I've never come across a commercial case. Uh, e e even um, if an individual is hopelessly impecunious, I've never even heard of a competition case at any level of complexity being mounted um, under the prospect of legal aid. So unless you belong to some group, and that can call upon expertise in various different relevant areas, I just think it's going to be very difficult for lay litigants um, to pursue this. Um, and hence that feeds into this question of collective redress mechanisms and representative actions, which I'll come back to in a moment. Um, this slide and the next two or three slides really is about standing. What individual can take a case rather than trying to evaluate um, in any way the merits of that case or how we should go about um, looking at the substance of it? For the person to bring an action, he must have suffered harm if damages are what he's looking for. If it's an injunction or declaration, then he uh, has to show um, he has been threatened with harm. As I point out there, and this is an important point, I think, I use harm in this sense as an element of local standi. Can he bring the action? It has nothing to do with quantification, nothing to do with um, remoteness causation, or any of these other different concepts that we apply so as to try and get a proper handle on damages. Damages then are harm, recoverability, I, I've just mentioned these in passing. We know, of course, the actual loss. and um, We know uh, loss of profits, opportunity lost in interest, um, on recoverable damages. I don't really want to talk about interest, but it's a fascinating topic um, in its own right and could merit a paper as to how one goes um, about identifying the rate and um, how one segregates elements of the damages to which the rate might apply, the periods in question, should the rate um, be that at investment level, at actual loss level, compounded level, and, and so forth. I was at a seminar recently um, about this and it was quite intriguing. The ultimate conclusion was that if some legal certainty could be brought by specifying a rate, then even that might not fully compensate an individual in some case and might fractionally overcompensate in another case, it would produce a workable formula which just might be more attractive than having to work it out on a case by case basis. And um, as Evan pointed out, overcompensation um, must be avoided. And again, in that context, he spoke about punitive damages. Um, and I, I, I'm just not quite certain why, um, in, in such a rigid way, uh, punitive damages or exemplary damages or some form of top-up damages uh, could not be provided for even in exceptional circumstances. Um, essentially, full compensation uh, has its rooting in the traditional Latin phrase of restitutio in integrum. You put the individual back where he or she should be if the wrongdoing had not occurred. And of course, there are compensatory damages which most of us are familiar with. However, um, and in principle, it is, uh, one can see, uh, in the vast majority of cases, quite sufficient uh, if the claimant gets full compensation in that way. There are other cases, by a famous uh, English decision in Wooks and Bernard in 1964, which identified three areas, um, egregious conduct by state agents in effect, whereby you might have punitive or exemplary damages. Yes, it would involve paying more to the claimant than compensation in a compensatory sense, but it would involve no hardship um, on a wrongdoer, on a cartelier, who has every morning when he or she has got up has decided to commit a wrongdoing, has decided to perpetuate that wrongdoing, has colluded with others to do so, and probably um, has gained quite substantially out of it, not only to the detriment of consumers, but also to other competitors who decided to comply with the law. Um, it's cert the absence of it certainly doesn't do much for the principle of deterrence um, or dissuasion 
um, which must be an intrinsic element of any enforceable regime. Anyway, it's there in the directive. I thought I would get that red herring um, out of my system. There must be a causal relationship. Everybody's familiar with that. Again, principles of effectiveness and equivalence. A direct contractual relationship is not necessary. Prior finding by the NCA is not necessary. And if any of you should have a case uh, which calls upon a quantification of damages, please um, make reference to the commission, to the communication from the commission, and also the practical guide on quantification. Both of these documents are easy to read, and they're set out in different levels, a broad principle, but also detail, and they're extremely helpful in giving you a handle on um, how to approach it. This slide, slide number 23, uh, is um, also talking about uh, who the claimant might be, and I have been concentrating essentially on direct purchases now, but evidently indirect purchases are also included. The second bullet point there um, identifies perhaps a separate category of persons uh, who have suffered harm by reason of the umbrella effect. Just a quick word with that on that. Um, I think there should be an attachment to these slides uh, which if any of you are interested about the umbrella effect would be informative to read. But essentially what it is, there's a cartel in operation. The cartel has manipulated conditions in the market to further its own aims. A third party who is not a member of the cartel decides, decides to in, take advantage um, of those conditions to raise its prices and thus cause loss to others. This is an absolute oversimplification, and I don't even want to look at Adam Scott when I'm giving you that oversimplification because he will say, ah, it must be. In simple terms, it is something like that. Those individuals who suffer loss as a result of that kind of activity can also um, uh, uh, claim. Article 15 is an interesting article because it talks about um, different cl or claims being brought by individuals at different levels of the supply chain. And in effect, um, a court is entitled to take into account those uh, claims brought at different uh, levels of the supply chain relating to the same infringement, which may impact, or in the court's assessment, of the passing on the fence, and, and also we're dealing with um, indirect Purchases. Um, I have mentioned um, in this slide, this is slide number 24, passing on of overcharges. Uh, it, it really is not the essence of this presentation to give you any substantive detail about um, the passing on defence um, or, or when it is available or how it operates or where the owner's of proof is and when does the the onus shift, etc. However, it is a very significant um, article in terms of at least clarifying at the level of principle what should happen um, when the passing off defence is being raised or has been raised. Um, it, it deals with um, presumptions which are in the main uh, rebuttable. It deals with who has the obligation to raise it, how far that individual has to go before it can be responded to. Um, and again, that last point there is going back to Article 15 in that context. But passing on uh, the passing on defence, the passing on rules and regulations are really worthy um, of a separate consideration themselves. Collective redress mechanisms. I remember at one of our conferences asking the DIN Director General as to why collective redress was not um, itself incorporated um, uh, as an essential part of the directive. His answer was entirely uh, understandable and entirely satisfactory. Um, there are many other sectors of European law where this question of collective redress uh, would benefit um, the ultimate consumer, it indeed would benefit many people. And some come to mind, environmental protection, personal data protection, financial services, legislation and investor protection. It was felt really that it could not be justified to simply isolate competition cases from those other 
um, mass harm situations because they undoubtedly can give rise uh, to losses coming within that category as competition cases has. Hence the suggestions made, hence the recommendations made, hence the communication by the Commission on, on collective redress. The, there, there is little doubt but that even if you had an effective system of legal aid operating in one's country, that if subject to the imposition of certain safeguards there was in place a collective mechanism, then that surely would be more satisfactory from a consumer's point of view. That surely would be a better way of ensuring not only that infringers have been found wrongful at a liability aspect, not only that they were obliged to pay compensation, but that compensation in turn found its way into the pockets of those who truly suffered loss. It is driven at the level of principle um, by a fundamental value of the European Union, which is to create an area of freedom, social and justice uh, via access uh, to justice. And that, in turn, involves a high protection um, which the law should afford and which the law should ensure applies to consumers. I point out in, in the second uh, line there that mass harm is defined in the uh, directive and of course given the diversity and complexity of our modern economy there are several situations uh, not difficult uh, to think of which may give rise to that. Um, in any event it hasn't been possible to do so but we have the Commission recommendation in 2013 and just a quick word about a distinction uh, in the terms collective redress mechanism and representative actions. Collective redress mechanisms really mean a facility whereby two or more individuals with a common interest and a common infringement, even though variables are in there, can get together and, and pursue an action seeking to establish an infringement and if harm has been suffered seeking compensation for that. Representative actions are a different breed um, but can operate as, in one way in parallel with or as complementary to um, collective redress. Representative actions, uh, it is envisaged, will be carried out by nominated bodies um, who would be sanctioned um, at official level uh, to take on such action. The recommendation, I'm talking about the recommendation now, the recommendation uh, sets out strict conditions um, by which such bodies uh, could operate and if they were to breach any of those conditions then their authorization to continue to act um, as a representative agent of groups could be withdrawn. I've just mentioned one or two, there must be non-profit making and secondly their main objectives, the main objectives of their establishment, of their existence, of their purpose and functioning must coincide with the particular rights which are identified in the cause of action which the uh, claimants wish to pursue. A great deal of, of work has been done um, on collective redress to include representative actions. I am um, a member of ELI, which is the European Law Institute, and um, a sub-body of ELI, of which I'm attached, um, has been working on this uh, particular uh, um, issue for two or three years now, and um, has produced several drafts, and the latest draft um, you know, runs 200 pages, can you imagine? Um, of course, if that were to find its way, into uh, a legal measure from the Union, it, it would have to be condensed and uh, a good deal trimmed. But it's, it's on the one hand a discursive document, but on the other hand it's a document which is pretty much now ready to firm up and make recommendations in this regard. I should say the purpose of ELI um, and this particular subcommittee is simply to carry out the research is simply to have volunteers, judges, academics, lawyers and so forth come together, give their collective wisdom, produce a document and then pass it over to Brussels. Um, the dangers that everybody uh, knows of and are worried about 
of providing some mechanism uh, whereby uh, a group of people can come together uh, to sue collectively are set out in that last indent. Um, the, the overall experience is very much um, jaundiced by what we read um, from time to time uh, about certain states in America. Now, not all states in America um, uh, follow each other rigidly on what provisions they make for collective redress, but many do. And um, many lawyers have agreements with their clients beforehand that if successful, they will, as part of uh, their fees, take an X percent or a Y percent or a multiple of X and Y of the award in question. Many such agreements, in fact, also give the lawyers almost the final decision as to whether or not to take it. Um, that evidently uh, is a serious um, incitement um, on the one hand to take actions undoubtedly, on the other hand to pursue them uh, in favour of the client to extremity, but on the other hand to in fact run with um, money in the hand so to speak um, in case of an adverse outcome. I just come back to the no punitive damages point here uh, and that is an inhibiting effect. It is hoped that that will have an inhibiting effect um, on, on avoiding um, abusing uh, litigation in the future. It is proposed that it will be knocked in rather than knocked out, which means that individuals have to actively decide to gather the grouping. I'm going to kind of wrap up here. I've just um, mentioned uh, who a defendant or respondent might be, you know, addresses of public law decisions in a hybrid or standalone action, non-addressees also. Um, I talk about carteliers within groups um, and liability for joint and several, uh, which I've just touched on this morning. Identity of the forum. This is a, a major issue in um, European law in itself. We have had uh, regulations uh, on this for quite some time and rules. We now have Brussels recast. Um, from 2012, um, which sets out in detail form the location upon which w one may take an action. Um, evidently, it has a principal rule, which is that you sue the person where he or she is domiciled. Equivalent provision applies to undertakings of public bodies. There are special jurisdictional rules, which um, are a navigation of that. And you will see that they're dealt with in Article 6 of the um, regulation. Uh, and again, I'm sorry, I'm not going into them. Article 7, they deal with contract, they deal with tort. Uh, and there's no reason whatsoever that this regulation ought not to apply to compensation claims under the uh, Articles 101, 102, as they do to other claims. I should mention in passing, don't forget that you may have to consult the Rome Convention. And um, if perchance there should conceivably be an issue in a competition case before you arising out of contract. And uh, you can um, just have a look at that when can a claim be brought and I've set out so. About uh, Regulation um, 1 2003, as you know under Article 3 um, when a case is before a domestic court and if that case has an effect on interstate trade, then the national judge is obliged to apply the provisions of 101 and 102. In that situation, the directive evidently will apply to the 101, 102 claim, but it will also apply to the domestic claim. And the, uh, the Commission saw uh, no justification whatsoever in, in fact, having two separate uh, rules or provisions dealing essentially with the same facts, essentially with the same circumstances, and in the same action. 